Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the introduction. As you hear, I, I have this uh, air conditioning disease that caught my voice. Um, Matthias Mohr, by the way, of Stack fame, uh, is also here in the room. So if I fall apart, then he will, then he will definitely take over. So this is a talk about OpenEO, Open Science for Earth Observation Research. Um, and it's, um, let me see how this works. Yes. Yeah, so this is where I started talking about scientists and Matthias asked, what are you doing here at this European track and not at the academic track when you talk about sci what scientists do? But um, anyway, it's, uh, I think it's of interest. So scientists broadly, I mean, anyone who did a PhD here or, or, or a master knows how this works. They spend a lot of time, but as little as possible time on data wrangling and data analysis to get answers to questions and, and figures and tables. And then they write a paper and, and get the co-authors to agree, submit. And, and then next question, right? So you do that for like three years and they have a handful of papers and submit that and your PhD thesis is done and then you go to the postdoc and then hell breaks loose. But it's essentially the same thing that's happening there. Um, so oh, how do open scientists work, right? Everyone is talking about open science, which is the new thing. Uh, they do essentially the same thing, but in addition, uh, they take time to share uh, they share new or generated data, and then they take also the time to share all the details on how results were obtained, right? And of course, they spend as little as possible time on point two and three because they didn't get like less papers to write, right? They have to basically do the same thing to get their PhD. And so the catch here is that the sharing of all the details on how results were obtained Right? So you're not going to dump your hard drive somewhere on, like, you know, this is sort of a bit of a nightmare thing. So one thing, of course, is that you share your data that you generated or that you, that you obtained or collected in a fair way and a findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable way. But also that you use open source software for the analysis that you did so that everyone understands what you did and can sort of uh, scrutinize the details of that. Yeah, that is an important point because otherwise, you, you know, you use black boxes and, and what comes out and who will say what it is. So why is it so hard? Then I got, you know, frustrated so a long time ago already very frustrated about why it's, it's so hard for domain scientists. I mean, domain scientists, I don't mean earth observation specialists right, satellite image specialist, but I mean hydrologist, biologist, ecologist, here biodiversity people, agronomists, uh, meteorologists, and so on and so on, to use earth observation data and practice open science. Why is this so incredibly hard? Yeah, and then um, after, you know, running around frustrated for a number of years, I ran into an AGU conference where Google Earth had this Google Google had this Earth Engine workshop and so on and demonstrated that and that grew and for, for like 10 years and it's a fantastic product, really. It is sort of solves nearly all your problems, right? It's unraveled and it's easy to share on analysis with others. What you do is you, you solve your problem, you write a script, you click share, you copy a URL, send it to somebody else, somebody else opens it and sees it and says run and runs the same thing, right? So this is, again, it's really literally 10 seconds to share an analysis, right? So why can they do it and the rest of the world can do, can't do it? Um, the problem, however, the problems it does not solve is the problem is that the platform is a closed source problem. It is hard to extend. It is sort of an, a monolith. It's a silo. It is, um, you can't extend it with Python or R code that you custom wrote or do your custom time series analysis or something like that. And it, hard, it has hard limitations in its use, right? There you can dis discuss long about it. But, um, so you're not in control, essentially, right? So open alternatives usually require that you rent machines, install software, learn Docker, and so on, manage resources, organize your parallelization, organize your, learn Kubernetes if you're ambitious, and so on. So all these kind of things domain scientists really don't want to do. Right? So find your files, go through them, and so on. So there, there's a lot of focus on uh, to do things right now, a lot of focus on resource and data management rather than data analysis, right? So how you do things instead of what you do. Yeah, and there is Google Earth Engine that says, well, and then they, have, they, they now have 200,000 users or so, whatever is the number. 
Um, so there's a gap to be filled here, yeah, I felt, and, and we set out to sort of start talking about it and making a lot of noise and start in 2016 with a blog post on OpenEO and he said, we need a DDAL for Earth Observation Analytics, right? Like DDAL solves all our problems on file formats and so well, nobody talks about file formats as long as it's DDAL supported, anyone can read it, right? There's no problem in that sense. So we had this, this, this silo idea from the, you know, from the 80s GIS, this is a time when I, when I grew up that we still had this. And we, as, essentially we have the same silo idea with Earth observation analysis platforms right now. You either do things with Earth Engine or with Microsoft Planetary Computer, but not with both. You're not going to compare because that takes three months and who has three months to do that, right? You, and you have to understand all the differences and how things are called and so on. So, so that's not going to happen. So that's why we set out with and essentially, everyone does the same thing, or essentially does a lot of the same thing on all these uh, on all these imagery. So what we started out is basically describing what raster data cubes are. That is sort of the way the the, the model, the data model we have for these Earth observation data, where we have essentially raster data in x and y direction. We have a number of bands for a particular sense, and then we have time replication. Yeah, so minimally four dimensional uh, data cubes, and then we do things like we filter things, like we do selections, we select a particular band here, or uh, we select a particular moment in time, or we select a particular area that might be irregular or something like that. Other things we can do is that we reduce dimensions, right? We run a time series model on a, on a set of, of pixels uh, distributed over time, or that we combine bands into an index, for instance, or that we sort of reuse pays and compute averages over areas, things like that. We can do like filter operations, we can do spatial filter, we can do temporal filters. These are kind of operations that you typically do that everyone does and you want to have an environment that does that. Or you can do things like querying regions, right? Querying for particular geometries, ask like what is going on here, what, what are my bands uh, and my time steps. Uh, for these particular uh, geometries, right, reading to factor data cubes. So what is OpenEO? Uh, OpenEO is a solution to this problem in the sense that it is an, an API, that's an application programming interface for cloud-based processing of image collections uh, or slash data cubes, right? Um, the API, of course, the API is a thing that you need but that end users don't see. So it's not like like an agronomist needs to learn the API. I know the API is being used by applications that use the API that people are familiar with. Um, and this API not only specifies like how things are being called and done, but also what is being done in the set of processes in the set of all these things that I just showed in this previous slide, like the typical things you do with the uh, Earth observation data. So, <clears throat> Um, it is uh, also a set of uh, software repositories for back-end connectors. We are not reinventing the wheel. We're basically trying to sort of abstract away from all kind of existing uh, systems that, uh, that occur, like Open Data Cube, like GeoTrellis, like WCPS, like GrassJS, like Sentinel Hub. There are existing and operational, or might be operational, uh, uh, systems that, that do these kind of activities with Earth observation imagery, and we write clients for them so that everyone can use their familiar sort of data science interface, whatever it is, Python or R or JavaScript or visual editors in, in web browsers or quantum JS or something like that. All these things are in different stages of, uh, of, uh, of development, obviously, uh, but they're, uh, they're happening, yes, and they're being used. And then interestingly, um, there is also a set of uh, implementations now uh, running, uh, that means uh, running deployments that uh, include publicly accessible OpenEO Cloud, which is an ESA funded uh, activity, which is a service that users can now actually go to and, uh, and use. Uh, also, OpenEO is a community of users and developers, um, and it's an open source project with a formal governance uh, structure modeled along the way of many uh, OSTU project, uh, projects. Are done. So here's a little view on, on how things could look like. So this is the web editor that, that Matthias programmed. Here we have a graphical model builder, essentially. You, you connect to an, to an uh, OpenEO um, uh, endpoint, so to, an, to a, a processor, which is, in this case, is OpenEO platform. And then you can uh, start looking at which collections, data collections are there, Sentinel-2, Landsat-8, and so on. 
motors, whatever, and you pick one of them, you drag it to the screen, and you say, okay, this is my starting point, and then I'm going to do all kinds of steps on them, like I'm going to select a region, I'm going to select a time period, I'm going to, um, whatever, compute an NDVI of it and do something like that, and then in the end, I want to sort of have this process, then put it in, and show it in some kind of web service, like a WMS, and it is then being shown here. And you can do this in a synchronous way or in an asynchronous way. So synchronously, then, this would sort of react on zooming and panning and so on and recompute pixels. And asynchronously, you do that for larger jobs, and you get this job manager, and you can see which jobs uh, are in which states and whether things have finished and uh, sort of look at them. And here you can also see it's some kind of time series of uh, things, how things develop. Um, over time or, or are distributed over different bands or so. Um, there is an API. This is, of course, that means that uh, uh, that backends and clients developers know where to start. Yeah. So the, the API is really an, an open API, so a modern way of writing these things, uh, really developer-oriented, right? So this is not something that, that domain scientists or, or end users will will really see. So it defines how clients communicate with backends and defines discovery processes, batch job handling, and publishing via, via web services. It uses Stack. Stack is unsurprisingly, actually, we were at the Open Horizon 2020 project, 2017 to 2020, um, contributed substantially to the Stack specification. Substantially, that means that is what Matthias uh, did. He said, uh, you guys, you do things for images, but we want to do things for image collections and, and need to do that. So, he sat together with the people from Google Earth Engine and uh, wrote the uh, stack uh, image, the stack collection uh, specifications there, essentially. Yeah, this was one of these things where everyone sort of, you know, people were saying, oh, you have to look at OGC standards for, for solving this problem. And then we looked at OGC standards and looked and, and said, well, yes, deep sigh. Um, it defines a workflow language, so the process graph. So the process graph is nothing than like, like a computer program, right? Sort of a set of expressions that are being evaluated of arbitrary complexity. Expressions in computer programs are also uh, DAX, acyclic graphs. Um, and that means that there's not like, you know, limits to the things you can do in that sense. Um, it, the processes run synchronously or asynchronously, as I said and do uh, evaluate lazy uh, if, uh, if possible, if that makes sense. So here's a little excerpt of the API documentation, which is sort of the way that you know, web developers and so expect it, but not something that you would confront end users by. Here's how the slash jobs sort of endpoint is being described and how it could look like. So clearly this is not, not something for Earth, people want to use Earth observation data, but, but people want to sort of program against this kind of thing. And then the juice is really in the processes, all the processes that are being, being defined, I think there are like 120 or so of them. Um, that defines what can be done with Earth observation data through these data cubes. For instance, select image collections, define extents of data cube views, define mathematical operations, arithmetic mathematical logical operations, and so on, familiar from programming languages. Um, and you can export the various formats. And a number of particular things which I mentioned, like reduce dimension, that you work on dimensions of a data cube. And a nice thing that what you cannot do with Earth Engine is user-defined functions. And of course, you can do that here. So you can have your little Python code chunk or your R code chunk that does some kind of specialized time series method that nobody else, but that you would like to run on a large amount of imagery that you want to run and that you actually can because you're not dependent on some kind of big tech implementing this for you. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, aggregate temporal period, here's documentation of that that says, I have sort of all these, these, these data, five, for every five days I want to aggregate it to, for instance, monthly data and then work on the monthly data. Um, the data cube, the model we have is basically a multidimensional array with sp typically spatially temporal thematic band dimensions, but it can be arbitrarily complicated and we, we define a pixel or a cell essentially as a scalar, so not a record with variables or fields. Yeah, so the canonical case is pictured here is from the dimensions x, y, time, and band, or longitude, latitude, time, and band, we map to a single scalar value, which is a very simple thing. Uh, vector data cubes then arise naturally where you basically resolve your x and y dimensions to a set of geometries and end up with one dimension less and an array dimension that has, has geometries. Vector data cubes are a sort of uh, relatively new thing for, for a lot of, lot of people. 
here associated associate Rust, Rust to data, data cubes with Rust to data cubes as being the identical thing. Um, vector data cubes are basically multidimensional arrays with at least one spatial dimension that maps to a set of 2D vector geometries. Um, a problem there, and also an OSGO problem that we have, is that we are not so very good at representing vector data cubes as, you know, we don't have sort of very useful exchange formats for them. The best I could find is, uh, is, is NetCDF or, or CovJSON, and both are kind of not, not very well, um, not easy to handle, so to speak. Yeah, we have, of course, OGR simple feature tables, which is essentially a vector data cube that is one dimension. It has just a set of observations, and then it has attributes and columns. Uh, we have NetCDF and ZAR that, that has some uh, these the CF conventions, the climate the forecast conventions uh, that, that kind of uh, can tell you how to handle point, line, and poly polygon uh, geometries, uh, but there's very little tooling for that. And then there is CovJSON, which is now an, an OTC community standard uh, in a very mature stage of discussion, I think, uh, which, is, which is very good. Yeah? Um, but what we need is basically support and tooling for data cubes, in particular for vector data cubes. Uh, and what we also would, would need, I think what we really would need is a CovJSON uh, read and write driver for TDAL's multidimensional array API, yeah, which is an excellent API for handling um, data cubes in, uh, in, in GDAL uh, and exchanging them with, for instance, NetCDF and ZAR and so on. Uh, and that we could do that. So I think that is, those are things that, that, are now, that are now missing. So it is basically uh, vector data cubes are a very natural thing. If, if you query a data cube at, at a set of points, you get a vector data cube, but how do you store it? Um, and when you have that nightmare, then you know, nothing's going to move. We have an OpenEO platform, as I said, that is a running pl platform and running instance of OpenEO. Uh, with public access funded by the ESA. ESA, one of the big funders of this conference. It's also uh, created by a project that's funded by, uh, that's funded by ESA. And uh, uh, that is very good, yeah, in the sense that we were being forced to really make something that is uh, operational and that is, you know, you get a nightmare of user authentication and management and everything. And, uh, um, and that is a sort of, a, that was an enormous uh, job to get that, uh, that realized. Um, there are different backends that actually run the OpenEO platform, the, the running instance, so to speak, the publicly running instance now of OpenEO, OpenEO with the cloud. Uh, there is the Vito backend, which runs on the GeoTrellis. So that GeoTrellis is kind of a layer on top of Spark. Uh, there's the CreoDS backend, there's the EODC backend, which mostly runs on OpenDataCube X-Ray Dask stack. And then there's the Sentinel hub, which runs on uh, Synergize dedicated software uh, as far as I know, in the Amazon cloud, uh, they can also run it on different cloud environments. So there is al already four backends that are basically uh, essentially in production, so to speak. Uh, there is the interesting question, like, you know, what is this? Is this, an, is this a standard or not? Or what are you working on? Like, and then, of course, the question is like, you know, what is the standard? Is it a de facto, de facto standard somebody people use? Or is it the Jura standard, the formal standard? And I always say that the good de jure standard evolves from a de facto standard and not the other way around. And people are now really going into this, the discussion, like, should we use OpenEO? No, we shouldn't because it's not an OGC standard. It, well, you know, we are creating it, right? Okay, go ahead and standardize it. But anyway, it is like, you know, it is a process and it's a very complicated process and it takes time. And so I'm not, so nobody here is against standardizing this, but it is a useful thing. There's no really sort of alternatives in the room and, um, and, so, and so go ahead, yeah? So um, OpenEO in any case has been set up entirely as an open community-based process. The idea that software, um, the ideas and software have been adopted by industry without any involvement of OpenEO open, you know, team members. So that is an, uh, a demonstration that, that we use sort of uh, modern technology that can be adopted. We align well with OGC API. Um, we complement in some sense API processes uh, where processes defines process at an abstract level, where we define concrete process, like the things you want to do with Earth observation data. 
Um, nobody in the Open EO project or consortium actually is, is against adopting things as a formal standard. So it's not, the slowness is not with us. The slowness currently is actually with OGC not answering our emails. Yeah? That is the, the current state of affairs. And there's, anyway, there's a lot of de facto standards, like things around that everyone uses and that work uh, that are not formally standardized. Yeah. So what's coming up? Um, there's a lot of projects coming up. We're looking at uh, classification problems, artificial intelligence, machine learning. So that handles, that calls also for handling of training data, which is an additional, mo additional problem. Handling of factor data cubes and the tooling around that, sort of looking, visualizing them and so on, is, is something that is, that is, you know, in its infancy. Uh, and there's a number of projects coming up where we also look at the application into other domains like meteor climate, hydrology, agronomy, and so on. And uh, we're also trying to put OpenEO everywhere in a sense of deployment in other clouds in fed with federated computing, a local computer, running an OpenEO backend in your browser, these kind of experiments with small data that makes total sense. So we're trying it. Um, wrapping this up, OpenEO is an open community-based initiative to make it easier for non-developers to use open science principles and use Earth observation data archive. So everyone is basically invited to, uh, to participate and to contribute and to help and help with, you know, start using it and ask questions. That would be the first, that would be a great help already. From doing reductions in large image, image data cubes, it will move towards machine learning and wider domains that is currently happening. And in fact, as I said, factor data cubes naturally arise when you have dynamic data and some work is needed to get, you know, some tooling going on in the probably also in, in other OJC, in, sorry, in other OSGO uh, projects and in Kafka and so on. Um, I think that's all. Thank you for your attention.